that you should and try out all the things you always wanted to be. You'll see, cause I know what I know, that you've got it in you. And I see, that you are a winner, a blue sky that gonna go on and on, all day. If you go, then you know, you'll get up the mountain. Summer sun.
Welcome to APS. Your conference is in progress. I'm going to start this again, Ben. I'm signing away. I'm signing your left away. Well, Brenda warned me that we had. We did, actually, at the end, too. <laughs> Okay. Well, I was 
Yeah, there's like, I'm, I wasn't surprised though. I will say, at least it was the other schools too, in the other district. You lied? <laughs> It's the same document. It's the same document. It's the same document as this weekend. So if that's the one okay. you looked at, she, uh, Jennifer, just wanted to make sure you had it in front of you as well. So okay, it's the same. Oh, it's so, like so oh, no changes from the weekend. So okay. The only Yay. thing that they she added was for, um, and I don't even think it shows on that one for accessibility. We just on each page we added propose and then or or current and then proposed okay otherwise it's okay because then I was going to try to transfer whatever I had here to here <laughs> got to move on because we've got so many people behind you. do we have a do we have a lot of people signed up yes do you like it that's it you like my hair slicked back it's because my, my daughter's like, Mommy, put your hair, slick your hair back. You look cool. And I was like, well, I just want to look cool. But it should be okay. All right. <laughs> okay. That's from a 27-year-old, you know. It's not <laughs> She's 27, yeah. I'd like to call to order the Board of Education for Wednesday, March 21st, 2018, for 5 p.m. Uh, I would like to uh, give the podium here to uh, Sandra, who is our interpreter, please. Buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita interpretación al español, levante la mano y le alcanzo un receptor de interpretación. Gracias. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, and if you could uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like a moment of silence to honor all of our APS graduates who have lost their lives while serving our country. Thank you. I'd like a roll call, please. Yolanda Montoya Cordova? Here. Peggy Mueller Aragon? Here. Lorenzo Garcia? Here. Barbara Peterson? Here. Candelaria Patterson? Here. Elizabeth Armijo? Here. Dr. David Piercy? Here. Uh, before we adopt the uh, agenda, I'd like to move item 7B.1. Just before the consent item, we can consider that separately. With that uh, uh, change, I move have a motion for adoption of the agenda and approval of the March 7th. Board of Education meeting minutes and February 26th special Board of Education meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. We'll go on to recognition of students, staff, and community. Uh, board member uh, Montoya Cordova. It's been a while. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, board meeting and thank you for coming. Our first recognition will be introduced by Yvonne Garcia. Assistant Superintendent for Zone 3. Well, good evening. We are excited tonight because one of our principals has received an amazing award. Dr. Linda Townsend Johnson, principal of Sunset View Elementary School, received the Franklin Douglas Award as a champion for local education at the annual Cotton Club Scholarship Gala. The evening was organized and sponsored by the New Mexico Black History Organizing Committee and the Albuquerque Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. 
The Franklin Douglas Award is given to someone who shows exemplary commitment to the community and strong leadership as a champion for education. Dr. Townsend Johnson has been involved in education for 25 years, teaching at all levels from preschool through college. At Sunset View Elementary School, Dr. Townsend Johnson has a commitment to teach children how to serve others, and that is shown daily as you walk through that campus. The school community conducts annual fundraisers to provide food, clothing, toys, and other items to needy students and their families. In addition to teaching community service at her school, Dr. Townsend walks her talk as the president of the NAACP Rio Rancho Northwest Branch, Northwest Mesa Branch. In that role, she has placed special emphasis on financial literacy and has helped families retain their homes, establish budgets, and invest in their retirement savings. Dr. Townsend Johnson, will you please come to the podium? Thank you for your work with our children. Thank you, thank you. Let's show our appreciation. This afternoon, I'm going to be a woman of very few words. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you. It was truly an honor to receive this award from the community. Um, it's always shocking when you hear 25 years of service and it's you. <laughs> it goes by fast, but it's great work. As an educator, it has been awesome to be in the field to make a difference in the lives of children and their families and when you get to see them grow up and become the wonderful people that they were intended to be. Thank you for this recognition this evening. Thank you. Our next recognition will be introduced by Dr. Antonio Gonzalez, Superintendent, uh, Assistant Superintendent for Zone 2. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez, would you please come to the podium? Mr. President, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy, good evening. Tonight I have the high honor of recognizing an outstanding bilingual program. The New Mexico Public Education Department recently recognized Alamosa Elementary School at the state legislature on Friday, January 26, for its effective bilingual multicultural education programs and was presented the Bilingual Multicultural Education Program Recognition Award. A few of the factors contributing to the growth and success of the dual language program at Alamos Elementary include hiring highly qualified bilingual educators, providing professional development opportunities based on the best teaching practices and sound research, and forging relationships with the community. The school's bilingual team is dedicated to empowering students through meaningful, in-depth learning in both Spanish and English. The program promotes positive self-identity 
and respect for cultural diversity. Through the program, the students have received a strong foundation in language as well as culture and academics. Principal Riki, would you please come to the podium and introduce the staff from Alamosa and allow us the opportunity to congratulate and honor you and your team. Thank you. Uh, staff members present here today is Ms. Ana Lopez, our fourth grade, fifth grade combination teacher, uh, Ms. Ja Donahoe, our assistant principal, Ms. Uh, Stephanie Lozoya, and her daughter, Ulyssa, a third grader in our bilingual program. And absent tonight are Ms. Orozco in third grade, Ms. Gurola in kindergarten, Ms. Uh, Chavez in first grade, and Ms. Rivera, uh, Ms. Lopez's team partner in fifth grade. And I have to say, all the work really goes to the teachers who are working with our children. They are a phenomenal team. They are spending extra time working collaborative, and that's what makes the team, and that's what makes this a success. It couldn't be done without my teachers. So my whole uh, thank goes to my teachers. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Let's hear it for the Alamosa team one more time as we recognize them. Our next recognition will be introduced by Dr. Chris Muir, Executive Director of Student Family and Community Supports. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Piercy, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy. Um, tonight I have the honor of recognizing an exceptional health assistant. You know, I always get asked about um, CPR and that kind of thing, and if we ever had to do it in our schools and you know, fortunately, we don't have to do it very often. But um, when we do, we're very lucky to have some people like Miss Linda Vewe, who is a, has been in healthcare for over 40 years, including working in the hospital for 28 years. She is also a CPR instructor for many years and taught CPR to mothers of high-risk babies in the intensive care unit. Earlier this year, Ms. Veiwe was called upon to use her training to save the life of a student who collapsed on campus and quit breathing. Mm. That student was very, very lucky that Ms. Veiwe was there. Um, she performed rescue breathing on the student and maintained his airway, or her airway, I'm not sure who it is, when, um, until the, the emergency medical services arrived. The student is now doing well and has returned to school. Ms. Veiwe, will you please come to the podium and join me? <laughs> Would the family members and any staff that are here to support her please stand so we can recognize you? Thank you so much for your quick response, and I'm probably not the right person to thank you. I think the students probably thanked you a hundred times, but um, please let us show our appreciation again for Linda's work.
Just wanted to say I have a personal appreciation for people who perform CPR. <laughs> yeah, number twenty-three. Our last recognition will be introduced by Scott Elder, Chief Operations Officer. Mr. President, members of the board, um, it's a night of extraordinary people. Uh, because I have the honor of recognizing several more who uh, really stepped up in a time of need. At about 6 p.m. on an extremely cold January night, residents of the Solar Via apartments had to be evacuated due to a fire engulfing their third floor. Uh, some of these residents were in wheelchairs, others used walkers. Um, many of them had only the clothes that were on their back and uh, had left their valuables and their medicine in the apartment buildings as they had to leave. Fortunately, everyone safely exited the building, but the facility sustained extensive water damage as the blaze was extinguished. And it was very clear that the 65 residents, many of whom were elderly and disabled, and their pets would need a place to stay, at least for the night. Hayes Middle School graciously opened its gym to their neighbors in need. The Hayes staff, um, their custodial graveyard shift, APS police, John Dufay and, and myself, uh, were able to coordinate with the American Red Cross to provide cots as well as a warm, safe, and hospitable place for our community members. I will say that I was there fairly late at night and people were really bending over backwards to make them comfortable. The next morning, I witnessed numerous staff coming in with fruit, uh, pastries, um, welcoming the, the, the residents and their students uh, were remarkable. They recognized that these people needed a little bit of space. Um, they were invariably kind when they bumped into them. And uh, I know that they had a prior relationship based on a reading program that the students would go over and spend time with the residents. And uh, it, it was awesome. It was really awesome, and it's exactly what we're supposed to do as a community, and the Hayes community stepped up. Several of the people who shared their time, talents, and hospitality to create this safe space at Hayes were able to join us this evening. Some of them were not. Um, we did have some student representatives. Um, however, they had to choose between the board or their soccer game. <laughs> I have bad news, board members. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it was not as difficult a decision as we would like to think, but uh, I'm sure they struggled. So as I call your name, would you please come forward? Uh, Officer Keith Green, Officer Sean Garza, Officer Anthony Medrano, Officer John Mato, Officer Jared Chavis, and Officer Lily Gonzalez. Exe uh, let's see, the Executive Director of Maintenance and Operations, John Dufay. Actually, if you just want to hang out right here. Uh, assistant uh, Principal Antoinette Valenzuela, Assistant Principal Andrea Carbajal, Head Custodian Thomas Chavez, Community Schools Coordinator Beatrice Valencia Riano, Family Liaison Candice Cliffcorn, Teacher Regina Jolly, Secretary Michelle Salas, Bookkeeper Monica Rodriguez. Would any family members or community members that are here to uh, support these recognition gifts, would you please stand so we can greet you? Awesome. And I just, I just want to thank the people behind me. You stepped up and you took care of our neighbors in need and I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. So let us show our appreciation for these guests.
Yes, when you were there. I remember. How you That concludes our recognition and congratulations again to everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight and uh, we're soon to begin a public forum. We're going to begin public forum. Um, whether you are here with a request for the Board of Education to consider, provide information, or just to see how the Board of Education operates, we want to know that you're all welcome. The Board of Education has established rules for expected civil behavior during the meeting and public forum. Upon signing in to speak tonight, you received a signature form and copy of the procedural directive, which outlined those rules for expected behavior. The presiding officer will enforce these rules as appropriate through the meeting. Tonight, there are eight speakers. Therefore, to accommodate the greatest number of speakers, each one has two minutes uh, for comments within the 30-minute public forum. The time remaining to speak will appear on the screen in front of you, and you may not yield your unused time to another speaker. You are always welcome to submit additional comments to the board in writing if you are unable to convey your message or you're not able to speak within uh, the time allotted for the 30-minute public forum. The Board of Education encourages you to stay for the entirety of the meeting so you may listen to board members' comments before we adjourn. And only at this time may your concerns be addressed at the discretion of each board member. So the first speaker is, I'm gonna call up actually the first three speakers and if you could just line up by the podium, uh, we'll go from there. The first is uh, Doug Brown, Joanna Cox, Michelle Lopez. You, Ready? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yes, Dr. Piercy, members of the APS School Board. My name is Doug Brown and I'm here to speak on school safety. Years ago, I saw a cartoon showing a sign on a building that said, these premises protected by a false sense of security. Sadly, I think that's about all that's protecting our teachers and students in APS. I see that the APS School Board last week decided to support the resolution by the Council of Great City Schools while I have no problem with restrictions on the sale of assault weapons, that's not the main issue. Most school shootings did not involve assault weapons. I can't see how the measures proposed in that resolution will make very much difference. We need concrete measures that will make a difference. One thing that concerns me is the focus on stopping the school to prison pipeline. That is exactly how Broward County Schools ended up with 17 students killed in a mass shooting. By their misguided attempt to prevent ruining one student's chances for future success, and by ignoring major warning signs for years, the school system allowed many students to be killed and injured. Compassion for one criminal student resulted in a serious lack of compassion for many victims. I grew up in the rural South where almost every family had a firearm at home. They weren't locked up and the students knew where they were, yet school shootings were unheard of. 
Clearly the problem isn't the availability of guns. It's the overall deterioration of our society. The only thing that works is enforcement of consequences for misbehavior. If students do not respond to disciplinary actions, then they should be removed from our schools. If their behavior is criminal, they should be turned over to the authorities. I challenge you to adopt such an approach. If you continue on the current path, I fear we will one day experience an event like the one in Broward County. Thank you. Thank you. Joanna Cox. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I also want to thank the members of the Rio Grande baseball community that are here with me today. I am a proud sponsor of the Rio Grande baseball program. I've been a sponsor for years. Part of the reason I invested in this program as a small business owner in Albuquerque was the mentoring pro partnership that the older boys or the senior boys have with the younger boys, as well as the constant grade monitoring by the coach Orlando Griego. This program has experienced through his leadership and his development over the last several years, a graduation rate of over 97%, which is astounding in the South Valley and Albuquerque as a whole. Last spring, the students that are part of the baseball team registered for this baseball class. Unfortunately, a few days before the, the school year started this year, they were told that this class no longer existed. This was an abrupt change and quite a significant derogation from the curriculum that was in effect last spring when all these students registered. As a result of this sudden and abrupt change, the baseball program has gone from three teams down to two. We have lost students because of eligibility. The coach is not able to monitor the grades as he was allowed to before, nor does this mentorship program have the ability to work with the students to help them study, help them learn, and help them grow as young men. The South Valley is a beautiful place. I have lived there for years. As part of my time in Albuquerque, I'm a very proud sponsor of the Rio Grande baseball team, and I would really appreciate having that class reinstated for the benefit of the players, the boys, and the high school as a whole. Thank you. Michelle. Good evening. My name is Michelle Lopez. I'm a mom of three ball players, one of which one of which earned an academic scholarship and made a college baseball team. Our baseball family and community is requesting the reinstatement of our baseball class. The baseball class has had many positive effects on our ball players, not just on the field, but in the classroom as well. The baseball class is not just about hitting, pitching, fielding, conditioning, and staying competitive, but also learning life lessons such as teamwork, self-discipline, and hard work. This class also provides study hall and mentorship. These coaches have an understanding and passion for what they do. These things provide an advantage for the players to succeed and graduate so they can reach the next level in their lives. Mr. Bell has claimed there was no money in the budget for this class. However, she added new electives, new electives. She didn't add math, science, English, and history. She added hotel hospitality and animal science. These classes, in essence, replaced the athletic class, the baseball class. In animal science, there have been two substitutes, and hotel and tourism, three permanent substitutes. And in the hotel and tourism, the fourth week grading period ended, up, ended February 16th and the students still don't have a grade in that class. We didn't find out um, as a family that the athletic class was gone until the kids went to pick up their schedules. That's when we found out. How are we supposed to work together with administration if there's no willingness on the administration's part to get parent, player, and coaches input before this happens? Again, we're just asking for reinstatement of our baseball class. It's very important to these kids. Thank you. Thank you. Next. The next, uh, the next, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call up the next four. Um, Franklin Ghana, Andy Peck, and Arthur Almaguer. I'm just gonna go with the three. Um, when the news talks about APS's billion dollar plus budget, they ignore the fact that at least half of that is put aside for capital outlay, um, which is to build buildings and um, facilities. 
They forget uh, the day-to-day -day expenses such as utility bills, salaries, uh, operational budget. Um, I think 8% goes to central administration, 13% goes to um, custodial and maintenance, and the, 80, the other 85% goes to teacher, EA, and um, counselor and librarians um, and principal salaries. Um, and that is completely ignored uh, by the media. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know that that's, that's basically what that is put aside for. And uh, on a personal note, happy early birthday, Board Member Peterson. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, my name is Andy Peck and I'm the father of two students at Manzano Mesa Elementary School. Um, but yeah, so thank you for this opportunity, uh, Mr. President, members of the board, thank you for your service to our community. Um, Manzano Mesa is in Southeast Albuquerque, which is uh, in at least one of the highest crime areas in our city, if not the highest crime area of the city. Um, uh, sadly, you know, a little over one year ago, uh, three of the students that attend Manzano Mesa were uh, violently murdered, and there's a memorial, you know, the, a beautiful memorial that sits at the elementary school, but Ian, Eli, and Olivia Mascarenas uh, were killed. Um, my son was a friend of Eli, and so he talks about Eli quite a bit. The reason I'm here today is to talk about the lack of security at Manzano Mesa Elementary School. Um, I've been there to visit my sons, to pick them up, to take them to lunch, and um, the doors are all open to the entire school. Uh, I play trumpet. I went this year and played Christmas songs for the, for the kids during the lunch hour. And when I went there, I could walk right into the lunchroom, uh, no problem. There's hundreds of students, you know, sitting there eating lunch, and there's nothing stopping anyone from the street walking in um, to, to do that. I have spoken to Principal Candelaria, and she's actually now locking those, those particular doors by the cafeteria, but all of the rest of the doors to the school are currently still open to the community. Um, this week, I spoke at the community school council meeting. Uh, I've consulted with Jim Vatier, who's with Palms and Associates and a 25-year veteran of the uh, Albuquerque Police Department, and then also been in communication with, uh, with Mr. Scott Elder, who's here today, Dr. Blakey and Barbara Peterson, and other parents. And um, so I just wanted to bring up that problem that the school is very vulnerable and it needs more security. Um, the school needs access badges so that they can lock those doors and then they can, they can get in. Um, there's currently nothing stopping someone from coming in the front doors, so we need a security officer or something like that. So my petition is that funds would be immediately made available to Manzano Mesa to uh, to better secure the school and protect our children, especially my two little boys. Thank you. Thank you. you. Right there on my head. Yes. Members of the board, um, just wanted to just try to get the reinstated class back at uh, Rio Grande uh, baseball team. Uh, my wife has been uh, an APS teacher for 15 years. Um, academics, that's the first priority for her for and my son. My son's a sophomore at uh, Rio Grande. Um, my priority is sports. Uh, <laughs> so there's a reason I, we got him going to a different district for baseball, so I drive him every morning and I pick him up every afternoon. A um, Couple of months ago, he received an academic uh, letter award uh, for maintaining 3.5 uh, grade point average. Um, his mom's priority is just make sure school's first priority. So by the time we get out of, Instead of starting the class at 1.30 like the, last year, they start around 3 o'clock this, this year, so it's an hour ahead or an hour and a half after. So by the time we get home, by the time he gets to do homework, it's already an hour afterwards before he starts his homework. So just real simple, just, uh, just want to get that class back going. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And our last two speakers, Lorian Sanchez and Michael Anderson. Good evening, board members. I'm Lori Ann Sanchez, and I am also with the Rio Grande uh, High School community. I'm a parent there. I'm also the team mom for the um, baseball program. Um, I miss that we don't have a C team this year. Unfortunately, um, again, because of our class, a lot of our um, freshmen and sophomore players were not eligible. And um, 
we're asking again i'm going to um, say that we would like to have our class um, reinstated i don't think that the proper steps to take our class away was um, followed um, initially and so i would really um, appreciate the um, to get that validated and, and to get that reinstated properly um, I believe that this class also offers support and uh, mentoring and tutoring for our players. Um, that class at 1.30 helped them to get a head start on their homework, um, make uh, any efforts to um, get tutored, and um, some of the older players would mentor the younger players in a class that they previously had as freshmen or sophomore. Uh, my son now is a junior playing varsity, and as I'm speaking, we have a varsity game. I can tell you that right now with this game going on, we would probably have this room packed, jammed, with more parents and players and community members. Um, but please, if you will take um, into consideration, this is our future, and we want great players and good students from the South Valley at Rio Grande High School. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Piercy and board members and uh, Superintendent Reedy. My name is Michael Anderson. I'm the physical education teacher at Inez Elementary School um, just down the street. Um, I came and spoke to the board last year about this time um, about the, the importance of physical education. I keep saying I'm going to come back and make you all dance with me, but we'll, we'll do that another day. But um, yesterday I received a phone call from my sister, who's also a physical education teacher here in Albuquerque, and she informed me that um, one of the positions, the PE positions at her school was going to be cut. And as I did a little bit more research, didn't have much time because I had a lot of classes yesterday, um, come to find out that a grant that had been um, given to um, the state, that the state gave out to um, low-income schools, probably 14, 15 years ago, um, that um, the, the district is considering returning that grant. Um, the grant funded, um, like I said, low-income schools so that they could um, have more physical education for their students. Um, and so it wasn't until my trip here to, the, to, the, to APS that I found out that um, the board is considering giving back this grant not necessarily knowing that it's gonna cut approximately 30 physical education programs here throughout the city. Um, and so I I'm, I'm, was asked um, to ask to pull, pull the proposal off consent until there can be further um, discussion on the matter. Um, not only would it be moving, possibly losing 30 PE teachers, but moving people around because of seniority and things like that could have a detrimental effect to kids throughout the entire city. Um, so I don't, I know um, I emailed um, Dr. Piercy earlier today and it didn't seem as though he knew anything about it. And I know another board member was contacted. So until we know what's going on, I, I ask that we pull that off consent. Um, I'm also past president for um, Shape New Mexico. So we are more than healthy, ha happy to um, have that discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for your input. Uh, that concludes public forum. Thank you. We'll go on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, um, Dr. Piercy, members of the board, uh, community members, and staff. Last week, I joined teacher Turtle Haste. Yes, her name is Turtle. It's a beautiful name. Uh, and she's a teacher, a science teacher at Desert Ridge Middle School, and her science class recently uh, was using, uh, has been using the Sally Ride Earth Cam to capture photos of the Earth from the International Space Station. Very cool. Uh, Ms. Haste, Haste is a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration teacher at sea, a Fulbright teacher for Global Classrooms Fellow, and a N NASA Endeavor STEM Fellow. Her experience and background have allowed the students in her classes to access the special camera that's up in the space station three times a year. Over two days, the students selected and requested images by interfacing with the EarthCam system, desktop stations, and iPads. The experience encouraged the students to use atlases, weather forecasts. They really had to look at the weather where they wanted to see if there was clouds, it was a no-go, and maps. 
They chose their image locations based on world news, social studies, curriculum, and personal experiences. More than 300 images were requested of um, the space station. I was excited to be part of their learning experience and worked <coughs> at comparing Earth photos of Japan before and after the 2011 tsunami. It was very telling. Uh, and but however without student help um, I would have never been able to manage so I was very grateful and it was a wonderful time. KNME and APS are, a host, are hosting the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood Sweater Drive benefiting the APS Community Clothing Bank. Anna Dabria, Special Projects Facilitator APS and manager of the APS Community Clothing Bank and Franz uh, Joaquim worked with Donnie Chase of iHeart to record this week's episode of the iHeart Media Community Show about the sweater drive. They discussed the New Mexico PBS's Mr. Rogers Sweater Drive, presented in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Ms. Dabria, told some great stories of people who have benefited from the APS Community Clothing Bank, as well as sharing the journey a sweater will take from the donation box to someone's home. The Mr. Rogers Sweater Drive continues through March the 31st, and I know we all have sweaters that are gently used, but perhaps no longer fit. <laughs> uh, sweater donations can be dropped off at any Bank of the West in the city, cen in the city center lobby or at KNME offices um, and the university. And that concludes Superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to special issues. The first one uh, is a briefing of charter school contracts performance framework, and that's a discussion. Uh, presenters Deb Debbie Elder, Office of Innovation Choice, and Dr. Uh, Joseph Escobedo, Director of Charter Schools. Good evening, Dr. Piercy, members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity to bring the um, charter co school contracts to you. Um, just as a couple of quick reminders, uh, New Mexico state law states that the requirements um, for states the requirements for what a charter school contract should include. Um, we need to remember, or we need to remind the board that this document is the contract or agreement to allow the school to operate sp for the specified amount of years and cannot exceed five years. The contract does guide us in the processes for oversight, support, any non-compliance issues, or revocation if that were ever needed. And Dr. Escobedo will go over more details. Um, Mr. President, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy, um, in your packet is a briefing on the charter school contracts and the template that we use. Uh, we did not provide you each individual contract because each individual contract is um, I think 30 or 40 pages. Um, so each individual contract has individual uh, items in there that are specific to the school, but the general language is all the same and that general language allows us to hold all of our charter schools to the same standards and same processes for non-compliance and uh, revocation if, if we need to get to that point. In addition, I did wanna point out in the briefing document that we provided to you, um, the National Association of Charter School Authorizers um, did perform an evaluation of our charter school practices in 2016, and we have uh, improved our uh, contract template, and I just provided you that language just as a reminder. So we're almost getting to the point in a couple of years that we need them to come back to see how we've improved. So um, that's all we have to say about the contract template. If we, any questions on the contract? Are there any comments from the board members? Hearing none, we'll go on to the uh, item B, which is consideration approval of the charter school contract performance framework for the ACE Leadership High School. And again, the same folks presenting. So, um, Madam President, or Mr. President, uh, uh, um, members of the board and Superintendent Reedy, um, uh, we are asking for your approval of the contract for ACE Leadership High School. You did approve uh, the renewal in December and we have executed uh, the contract. They have met the conditions 
for, uh, that we uh, stipulated and those conditions were they needed to provide us more information on standards and how they were being implemented uh, based on project-based learning, uh, their use of adaptive interim assessments and their plan to increase participation in common state assessments. In addition, we have uh, worked with them to develop their uh, three mission-specific goals, which they will be used to hold them annually accountable for um, items of, of performance outside of the school uh, grade that is reported by the Public Education Department. So we are asking for your approval. Comments from board members? So Dr. Escobedo, um, so they did meet the, um, did the school meet its mission specific indicators, increasing the number of A students earning industry certification. So that's already, that's already occurred then, correct? No, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Board Member uh, mueller Aragon. These mission-specific goals the um, are for the, the three-year contract that we approved in December. Okay. So we will be monitoring these goals and annually reporting them out through the state uh, performance framework okay. uh, and in our annual report. It's a, a measure for how we hold our charter schools accountable. and. Um, we quickly went over the performance framework briefing, but the briefing on the performance framework is also in your packet, so I apologize about that. Okay, thank you. Board Member uh, uh, Peterson? Yeah, so just for clarification, there's not, there's nothing in the framework or this, these contracts that say this has been or has not been done. This is simply the measures by which we're going to be they're going to be evaluated and what they need to be doing into the future. Mr. President, uh, Board Member Peterson, yes. Uh, what I was referring to about uh, they had to meet certain conditions before we even had conversations with them of their contract, if you remember back to long ago in December when we had those, um, uh, those conversations. Any other comments? Board Member Patterson. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Escrito and Dr. Piercy, I, you know, I don't know if this falls in line with this. Remember that lengthy uh, motion that we did, or you did, or with regard to the approval of some of these schools back in December? Was some of that language incorporated into some of this? Remember that? Uh, uh, Mr. The Mr. partnership that we said we were going to develop, these partnerships with these schools? M Mr. President and um, Ms. Uh, Pat Patterson, uh, we did incorporate that into um, the uh, contracts and I will get you that language. Um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but we did include that. We yes. include some of that language? Yes, that, that they will be partnering with us regarding uh, career and technical education. And, and it was a whole, it, I mean, it was this lengthy uh, motion that we made uh, back in December and there was an agreement to, to, to do that moving forward. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? I just have a basic question. A basic question from I Board Member it's... Garcia? <laughs> yeah. As um, opposed to a non-basic uh, question. Non -basic. <laughs> <laughs> What's the population of this school and what are, what, what's the potential numbers for each cohort? Because you have cohort one, cohort two. I, I don't see that anywhere, I was just curious. Um, Mr. President and uh, Mr. Garcia, that will be something I will get to you, sir, uh, on the potential numbers of the cohort. Um, most of their students uh, will be in uh, cohort number one, and, and that's how we defined it, but I will get you those numbers, sir. Thank you. I guess just in terms of tracking, I mean, are we talking about yes, one sir. apprenticeship or 10 or 15 or what? Y yes. Uh, they, when we talk about their... Um, when we talk about, like, for example, in number two, their apprenticeship programs, um, they vary every year, but we do have some data from this past year that we can use to um, project that forward, and uh, their numbers are not growing. They are consistent, and uh, the school is full on a waiting list. Okay. Um, it, it would just be, uh, for me, better to, to know sort of how are we doing year to year and how have we done yes, sir. Uh, since the beginning? Thank yes, you. Yes, sir, and, and 
uh, Mr. Mr. President and Mr. Garcia, that will be my responsibility moving forward to report to you annually on how they are doing specifically on their mission specific goals. Their mission specific goals have changed vastly from uh, when they were authorized by the Public Education Commission. So that's part of the work that we do. Once you approve the renewal, we sit down and we negotiate the contract and the performance framework. And so these goals will be how they will carry through through this three-year contract that we approved in December. Great. I remember uh, when I first joined the board, the, the school was, was in formation. And they had parents out on a Sunday morning in front, in front of what was Pro's Ranch Market at the time. And uh, they had... It was, it, I was impressed, you know, they were, they were hustling, trying to get students. But there was something in their literature that said, if you can't do the math, don't come. And that sort of threw me, because uh, public schools can't do that. Uh, so I just would like to know, you know, where we at, where we going, and uh, tell us what you've done. I mean, I'm curious about the kinds of apprenticeships that we're getting, um, you know, and, uh, and how are we doing? That just would be helpful since yeah. I've been. And Mr. President, Mr. Garcia, those are the exact things that we look at. Uh, once they come under our uh, um, authority, July 1st, I will be looking at all of those materials to ensure that they are not violating um, any anybody's rights or um, so having material like that would not be appropriate and I will be specifically looking for that, sir. But I cannot do that until July because they're currently authorized by the Public Education Commission. It wouldn't be under my authority currently. Thank you. And I just have a process question. Yes. Um, so the contract that we're negotiating now, it, this is just the beginning of it, right? So they, they haven't really been fully executed just yet. Yeah. Um, Mr. President and uh, Ms. Montoya Cordova, yes. Um, so once we you approve that tonight, then they will be fully executed uh, by their board as well, and okay. then uh, that will begin July 1st okay. because they are under the Public Education Commission until June 30th at midnight. Okay, I was just just was curious about the process. Yes. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the board, we are asking for your approval for the charter school contract and performance framework for Corrales International School. Uh, my predecessor and the executive director of the school, Mr. Tolley, is here for any questions uh, for, you, um, for you. But again, this school has been under the authority of Albuquerque Public Schools. I just completed their site visit this week. It was a very, very good site visit, uh, v doing some great work uh, with international baccalaureate students. And, you know, we had the discussion, you know, this school is K through 12, and they are like a one-room schoolhouse. And, um, you know, for some families, it, it is what they are looking for. So. Um, we have uh, negotiated their um, goals around Spanish language proficiency and uh, IB uh, projects uh, proficiency levels, and, and that will be their goals for the next uh, five years as well. Any comments from the board? A board member, Miller, I gun. So um, I was looking at the um, assessments. So I understand, I mean, the I station is used in English and Spanish, but the, which is the one that they use to um, measure language proficiency for the Spanish language? It is, is it the, the uh, stamp one? Yeah. Uh, okay. Mr. President and Ms. Mueller, I'd go, yes, it's the Avant Stomp, and that okay. is the new, um, and so we're really curious, this will be the first year that they use it, so we're really curious to see those, those uh, second semester results to see how they did compare from one semester to the other. Uh, Mr. Tolley was showing me some data earlier <clears throat> this, um, uh, this week, and so we'll be seeing, uh, was that this week, Mr. Tolley? <coughs> Two, yeah, two, yesterday, I think, so. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, things kind of bleed together. But, um, but that, this will be the first year, so we are, we are going with these targets because of um, the baseline year is this year for that assessment. Okay, I've just seen some, some schools that use it to measure the student growth when they're giving them their biliteracy seal. So, but it was it was interesting to look at it because I think they 
I think it's in like th 13 different languages. Like, I, I think it's pretty amazing. I think it's like Korean, Japanese, Mandarin. So I thought it was pretty, pretty phenomenal. Um, is it very similar to iStation? I today I I like start, I took a test in Spanish. You know, I was I was doing. I just ran out of time, so I just wanted to see what it was what it was like. So I should have taken the one for like kindergarten better than the one for high school. But uh, Dr. Piercy, members of the board, uh, we use the of course the iStation up K through two, and the Avent stamp uh, then is two and above or three and above. I'm sorry. Um, it's not like iStation. No, um, it didn't look like it was. And it, it's it's a little different than the, and I can't remember the name of the, the Spanish test we used to give, but it's brand new. It's quite expensive, actually. <laughs> and um, we will, we gave our, we're giving our first one now, so we'll have some baseline data to actually base and see what scores we can come up with next year. So we've kind of given an estimate of where we think our students can be. I, I mean, I, w I would love to hear how, how it works out, especially for some of our other schools that have some of these other languages. So it would be nice to, to hear what you think about it. Yes, ma'am. We'd love to have you and any of the board members come out and visit. Thank you. Any other comments? I'll entertain a motion for approval. I move for approval. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. We'll go on to item D. Uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the board, we are asking for your approval of the contract and performance framework for Montessori of the Rio Grande. We have authorized this school for several years. In fact, uh, we own the property that they are currently housed in. Um, and um, the principal, unfortunately, wasn't able to be here because she is attending the uh, International Montessori Convention and our conference in uh, Denver, but you'll notice their goals, again, are very specific to the Montessori practice, and uh, I had a lot of conversations with my colleagues across the country about how do we measure mission-specific goals around Montessori, because Montessori is uh, very different in the way um, it works with students um, and assessments aren't so uh, like IB um, you know they're not treated so favorably by teachers so uh, so it's a balance that we're playing and so they've been great to work with and uh, again they would receive a five-year contract comments board member Miller again so when you're looking at the habits of the mind, I think there's 17 or 16 habits of the mind, right? And so it says they're, they're to increase their score. So are all 17 scored from kindergarten on up? Do you know? Uh, no. So, um, Mr. Mr. President, Ms. Mueller, uh, Rio Grande, uh, Montessori of the Rio Grande is really looking at two components per grade level, and that so that's there. why we focused on the two components that may be for kindergarten may not be the same for uh, fifth grade. So, what we're hoping, and we had lots of discussion about this, is that um, as they grow in in grades, they'll continue to grow those habits in mind and, and continue to develop. So it'll be, it's very complex of how they're going to collect the data and such, but th I think they have a good system down. And, and again, um, in the past, they were really focused on short cycle assessment data of reading and, and math, and I'm really trying to focus them on mission specific goals because that's what they're for. They're not for just using short cycle assessment data. So, so when you're talking about the common rubric, is that the one that was created already Mr. by the President. habits of the mind? Because I look, I, I looked at that as well. So they're already created. They're not teacher created at the school. They're already created. So you're using those, Mr. President, uh, Ms. Mueller, are going. Yes, the school will be using those and collecting the data and then reporting it to me. We will always have a chance to audit the the data if we ever have concerns. Yeah. Well, they're pretty. All all 16 of them are pretty phenomenal. So if you have kids that can do that, it's something we should all do. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Escobedo. Any other comments? <coughs> Board Member Garcia. Um, so I have a comment that may not be in line with what we're talking about, but I want to just check with you. Uh, you know, it's a lovely school, and it's in my neighborhood. It's in Duranis, um, right next to the Duranis Community Center. And, uh, you know, one of the questions I, I asked when I initially uh, joined the board and we were talking with the school was, 
What is their outreach like, in a sense, uh, or in reach in the community? Because um, one of my concerns about charters is that in some ways it sets up a kind of segregated education system. So who gets the poor kids? Who gets, uh, you know, working class kids? Uh, there's a lot of traffic that comes up and down a street that's near where I live, which is fine, and it's tricky for the community. But uh, you can sure tell the difference between the school year and then the summer. And my, my concern is mostly just, uh, I know it's a lottery system, if I remember correctly, but um, is there any way that we can ask them to help us with some of the kids from the neighborhood that uh, would have an incredible learning opportunity if they went there, change the way they think, change the way they see the world? Um, but if we just cater to middle class and upper middle class kids with this school, I'm not so sure what we're doing. And that's just a general comment. I don't know if you can respond to any of it or if it's appropriate to not, that's fine. But it's, it is a concern I have. So Mr. President and Mr. Garcia, our role is to ensure that their, their lottery process is executed um, per their board policy that should align with state statute. So I have reviewed that and I feel confident that they do that. Um, I will I will have a conversation with Ms. Henwood about the outreach to the to the North Valley community and the Duranis community um, about what she has done. I don't know specifically. I do know, and I attended their actual um, open house that they had on a Saturday, and it's, it seemed well attended. Um, but of course, you know, how do you tell? I, I know that there was a, a high, they have about 120 students on their wait list, but again, we don't know, and unless we look at zip codes, where they're coming from. Right. Um, so, but we also know that's, that, um, and this is, this parallels the work that we're doing um, in innovation and school choice is, you know, parents are thinking in the fall semester what they're going to do the next school year. Right. So we've moved our deadlines of transfers and such to align in those processes so that parents may be applying to a magnet school, for example, at Janet Khan and also at Montessori of the Rio Grande, and then also maybe at Corrales, and they just see where they're drawn. And um, so it's, it's, it's complicated, but I do feel confident that they're following their lottery to the T and it's in line with state statute. Now to your question about the zip codes and where the students come from, um, we can get that. And most schools have a map and have done that analysis as well. Thank you. Board Member Peterson. So just to piggyback on that, I'm, this thing of charters offering choice is a smokescreen and a false choice. When we start looking at what our redesign of schools in APS is, and when we start looking at what our funding is, and to say that a few schools can offer, you know, whatever, offer the sky and do it by lot, and meanwhile not give sufficient support to our neighborhood traditional schools, not open up the ability for teachers in every single school to deepen their craft. It is a false choice. And all it does is siphon off that much more money, make schools more segregated. With all due respect, all you have to do is look at the demographics of Corrales International, of Montessori on the Rio Grande. They're wonderful schools. No doubt about it, and I see a response, but we, we have got to approach what we offer students in APS in a different way. And the choice needs to be in every single school. The choice needs to be every single student in every single school has the right to a baseball team and a baseball class and a dance class. I mean, this, this thing of saying we can, we can make boutique education and make it equitable is a false choice. And so I'm, I'm voting for these because 
they're on the road and my long range goal is that we learn some things and pull it back in but you know sending more, more students to charters isn't what's going to fundamentally turn around what happens in the life of every student in APS and I and I really believe that's where our focus needs to be and all we have to do is go through finance in our budget for next year and realize that giving a handful of kids something that looks really good isn't solving our fundamental problem. Other comments? I'll entertain a motion for approval. I so moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thank you. We will go on to uh, the next item on our agenda, which is uh, consideration for the uh, uh, presentation, anyway, for the Albuquerque Teacher Residency uh, Partnership. That's a discussion. Uh, Karen Rudis and uh, Dr. Ellen Bernstein and Dr. Viola Flores, College of Education, University of Mexico. And I'd like to recognize the fact that Dean Ochoa is here with us. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate that very much. Take some time out of your rather busy schedule as well. Good evening, President, Dr. Pierce, members of the board. We are here tonight to present the Albuquerque Teachers Residency Partnership and the members involved in it, and we're gonna explain the purpose in the PowerPoint and its goals. I am Karen Rudis, the Executive Director of Labor Relations and a partner that represents human resources for Albuquerque Public Schools. Lori Webster is our grant writer and she is the ATRP coordinator but couldn't be here tonight, but I wanna recognize her for all the effort she's, oh, good, I didn't see you, she is here. She's just sitting. <laughs> and um, we have our other partners here as well. Superintendent Reedy, um, Mr. President, and members of the board, I'm uh, Vi Flores. I'm from the College of Education at the University of New Mexico. I would also like to recognize our Dean, Hector Ochoa, and also uh, Trina Walker, who is our Department Chair for Teacher Education and uh, Leadership. They are here with us this evening. Um, good evening, Superintendent and board members. I'm Ellen Bernstein, I'm President of Al Albuquerque Teachers Federation. And I just want to draw your attention to the first slide, um, the cover slide, where you see the three logos from the Albuquerque Public Schools, the College of Education at UNM, and the Albuquerque <coughs> Teachers Federation. I just want to tell you that working in uh, partnership again has been wonderful. It's a revitalization, it's a renewal, it's a reconnection of a partnership, all those re's, of a partnership that we had um, for a very, very long time that we lost for a while. And it was um, great energy, intellectual energy and dedication uh, that created what we have to share with you tonight and it was wonderful to work together. And I just wanna say thank you very much to Dina Choa and Dr. Flores, Dr. Walker, Walker and all the doctors uh, for helping us with their expertise and uh, for human resources, especially Karen, for helping us put this together and keep us going. And I just wanna give a shout out to Lori, who's an amazing person because she really did all the work. <laughs> well, what we've brought to you this evening is basically a new idea for us, but it's a national trend in some respects. And what we wanna do is that we wanna prepare our teachers differently. We wanna prepare the next generation of teachers to really understand about learning, about teaching, and how to be an effective teacher in the classroom. And so um, what we have up on the screen for you to see uh, is that we're looking at the traditional teacher prep program, the way we do it now. And if, if you notice, it has little formal coordination with the district. Yes, we place our students out in the schools, but we really don't have a strong partnership with the district and the university. So the, res, the residency model does bring that forth. Also, um, 
but they spend about 16 weeks or sometimes less of time in the classroom. And so with a teacher residency, we're looking at a full year. So they would start, let's say, in the fall and then continue into the spring. So they would have a full year of uh, working alongside with a mentor teacher and then gradually taking on that responsibility. Also, the, the coursework we're looking at right now, it's, it's diverse and um, it's not the way that we, we would like it to be. So what we're trying to do is that we're going to make it more relevant to the school you know, and the community so that it's really tightly integrated with their clinical experience that they will have in the school. Also, um, the student teacher may or may not be connected to the school now. You know, it depends because they might spend two days, one day, whatever. But with this kind of a program, we're looking at them really being in there the full year and totally engaged within the school community. We have programs right now in working with APS, with the community schools, where we've already worked on doing some of this, where the students are really engaged with the community. They're there for longer periods of time. And so what we're presenting to you are really lessons learned from other programs that we have had with you all, with the, with the district. And then also, um, the student teachers are sometimes, the way we do it now, we, we place them in different places. What we would like to do with the residency is that we select schools and we place a cohort of students at those particular schools. And so it, it's really very tight knit. And so it would be really very different. Right now we don't have the funding with this particular program because it is a funded program. We will have funding for uh, each of the residents. And so that in itself uh, is, is huge. Most of our students work, uh, they have night jobs, they do different things, and so we're hoping that this stipend of 14,000 will be able to really help them with some of those finance, uh, some of those expenses. The benefits for this program is, is basically, um, like I said earlier, it's other places are doing it across the country. Uh, New Orleans, Nashville, I, I saw something today that came out from St. Louis, and they're really having success with some of these, with some of the things that they're trying to do. It has a, a positive impact on the teacher retention, teacher quality, and, and recruitment, because they, like I said, they, there's the, the mentoring, there's the support for them. Uh, also, some of the studies show that there's an impact on the student <coughs> achievement within the schools. And so that in itself, we, we are really um, excited about. We're going to con definitely collect quite a bit of data because I think it's important for us to know about the benefits of this residency a model program. Um, it's, we want to improve the clinical experiences, and that's the important piece at this point. I want to introduce you to the mission of the Albuquerque Teacher Residency Program. Our mission is to make sure that we recruit, prepare, and retain what every student deserves. And this is a phrase that Linda Darling Hammond uses often, a competent, caring, and qualified teacher. And I want to point out that this is a a way to not just attract people who are looking at teaching um, possibly as a second career, but to actually retrain, retain them, to give them the support that they need to be successful in their beginning year. And of course, after residency, we have that great mentor program that really helps them to uh, continue their <coughs> learning and their support. So we are basing this on some core values. We know that teaching matters. We know that teachers matter. We know that <coughs> equity and social justice have to be at the center of our practice as teachers. And then this is going to be woven within everything that they do with the embedded faculty member at every school. 
that relationships are the foundation of teaching and learning. And so, as Dr. Flores just said, the relationships that people will build within their school community with their colleagues, with the parents and guardians of the students, and of course with the students, it matters that you're there for more than 16 weeks. It matters that you're there for a full year, and you can see the whole cycle of a, of a school year. Um, what matters also is reflection and inquiry. It's not a here's a cookie cutter approach to teaching every child in every school in every district. It's here's how we teach these kids in this school in this district. Growth and development occur over time, and we know that we want to form a continuum of support for people who are interested, all the way from pre-service, like our Teachers Rising, Educator Rising programs in some of our high schools. We should, you know, keep that interest going and then keep that support going. You know, residency models are based on international research. This is not just something that we're lucky enough to have a grant to do in Albuquerque and a couple other places in the United States. This is truly best practice, that we support a teacher residency just like doctors have a doctor residency or medical residency. Um, and that's that idea that you grow over time, that you don't learn how to teach in a crash course and then go in and you're the teacher every child deserves. It takes a long time to develop our teachers. We know that teacher preparation and development integrates research theory and practice, and that's that partnership that developed this. We integrate everything that we bring to the table from what the district needs and hopes for every kid in the district to what we know as practitioners, um, both from theory and practice, has to happen in teaching. And then, of course, it's based on the idea that teaching is a profession, that it's not something that you learn by um, applying for uh, an alternative license and taking a couple courses if you're lucky at night and then voila, you know everything about how to be a teacher. It really is a profession and it has a discrete knowledge base. Our goal for the next school year is that we're gonna recruit 25 aspiring teachers. We also, we already have some people who are showing interest. We want them to already have their bachelor's degrees and we're gonna place them carefully in the three schools that have applied as full-time residents. The residency program is going to have, as I said, embedded faculty that will integrate the rigorous work of earning your master's along with the theory behind pedagogy connected with the actual practice that then they can reflect on every day with somebody there to support them. I'd like to add to that that we are targeting the EAs with bachelor's degrees because they're already in the classrooms and this actually gives them the ability to have an income and um, they're perfect for this program. So we are meeting with Kathy Chavis of the union for an information regarding that as well. The, the residents uh, will apply for the, for to, to be a resident and then they also will be interviewed. Uh, by faculty from the College of Education as well as from the district and from the union. Uh, they will also qualify for a master's. Uh, so they will, when they, when they are admitted into this program, then they will also be reviewed by the faculty for admission into our master's uh, graduate program as well. So that they, when they finish, they would have their license plus uh, their, their master's with the three additional courses they could have their master's degree. They will be required to pass all state uh, required tests for licensure. They will pay the cost for the tuition of the fees and the books. But as we said earlier, they will have the opportunity to earn the uh, 14,000 stipend um, during that residency year. And so um, we will then work with them. And then, of course, like I said earlier, they will receive uh, from the state the New Mexico licensure in elementary and secondary education. They will take 24 credits toward the master's degree and then the additional three. And then the teaching position in APS, once they are, if, if they, with their successful, 
enoughness that they will um, finish the program and then be uh, hired by the district. The three schools selected for this unique program and opportunity are, um, they meet the requirements of the grant demographics and the, the feeder pattern. So they're Emerson, Van Buren, and Highland High School. All of those schools have had strong student teachers in the past, student teacher cohorts in the past, and they're all excited about it and can't wait to get this going because they know it also uh, gives them a teacher on board and they usually get hired at the same site after they're completed with this program. Hopefully we'll have so many that we'll have teachers for other schools as well. <laughs> So our next goal, as we're recruiting the residents, we also have to recruit the best teachers to be the master teachers. And the master teachers will have a resident paired with them in their classroom for an entire year. We're going to work on recruiting teachers um, at the schools to apply to be the master teachers. And they'll receive a couple things. They'll receive a small differential because um, I can attest, when you work with a student teacher, especially when you're working with somebody all year long, you have to take on added responsibilities. And you also get the benefit you know, of the small stipend, but also your own learning. And so you're learning in several layers. You're learning how to support somebody who is just learning how to teach. You're learning how to do that gradual release of responsibility while you're giving them feedback the whole time. And you're learning how to talk about your own practice and you actually end up deepening your ability to do your own work. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to, uh, for the existing teachers in these three schools. Also, they get to work as partners with uh, UNM faculty, which I found very enriching in my career every time I had an opportunity to do that. During the residency year, um, the uh, UNM faculty and the college will be very involved. They will be teaching the coursework in relationship to that, be part of also some of the supervision, and then the professional development for the master teachers. So the role of the UNM faculty is, is it's uh, in partnership, as we said, and so we're excited about that opportunity to be able to do that. We will have a full-time embedded faculty at the school site, which is that connector between the university and the school. And so that individual will help in the oversight, uh, working uh, with, the, with the master teachers, working with the students themselves, the residents, and then also help in the conducting of seminars when we pull them together to take a look at the things that they're learning, uh, challenges that they're facing, things like that. And so this additional support, I think, is going to be really, really helpful. We, we're looking at also other faculty from within the college, some of our doctoral students that we have, figuring out how do we pull in these resources that we have to better serve uh, the, the, the K-12 population in our schools. So the funding for this grant um, is a, is a five hundred thousand dollar grant from the National Teach Center for Teacher Residencies. They've provided a lot of support. Uh, they're out of Chicago, and we've met with them several times. They keep us on target for meeting our goals, and um, it's for the 2018-19 year. So it is just a pilot year next year. It's. Uh, we're going to need to sustain this program. So one of our big focus is how to determine how to find monies within our current budget to sustain it, because we really do see that this this uh, cl medical clinical practice works when you combine theory and practice in the clinical setting and the teacher setting. It re keeps our teachers longer. Um, we're not throwing them in without any past practice, as we are with a lot of our teachers now. So we need to find a way to fund this. And hopefully, as we build our continuum with our uh, building our pipeline with the mentorship program that sort of started this partnership 12 years ago before we had PAR, we had the first year mentorship program, we can build that into this pipeline and continue as we go on. Uh, 
Um, we really want to see a continuum of support attracting and retaining people into the wonderful profession of teaching to not just be an Albuquerque project, but maybe we could work together to make it something that the entire state is focused on. There's, there's a lot of practice and, and research behind this and we'll have our own stories to tell. I think this is a focus on revitalizing Oh, Sorry, I, dropped my duty. <laughs> I think this is this is a program that's going to help us focus on the future of the teaching profession in our district and beyond. This is um, a really pivotal moment for all of us in public education because as things have gotten focused more on this kind of blame and shame accountability. Fewer and fewer people have seen teaching as a viable career when in fact it's incredibly rewarding. And we want to keep telling that to everybody that will listen, to the whole community, to people who really want uh, later in life to become teachers or early or transition from being an EA. It's a really exciting conversation to be had. We are all of us who have worked on this real nerds about talking about teaching and the, the art and the craft and the research about being a great teacher. We um, enjoy um, being led by the residency um, cohort and learning with others and uh, get excited about p people presenting to us. So um, I think this is a great way to start the excitement and continue and eventually develop that whole continuum. I want to point out that once we have these master teachers working with these residents and modeling their practice, we will keep, I hope, the residents in our school district and they will eventually become our master teachers and our mentors for our uh, university students and then our beginning teachers. So it's a great cycle and we want to keep it going. And now we will stand for any questions you have. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting program. Uh, comments on the board? Yes, board member Armijo. I just have a few comments. Um, I'm incredibly excited about the program. Thank you for the presentation and all the hard work from the people in the room. <clears throat> I recently attended um, a presentation on mission graduate, and um, so they're real big, right, on having a profile of what a graduate should look like, and most of that profile is developed by our business community on what a graduate should look like. And so my question to mission graduate was, is, well, when are you going to work on what a profile of a teacher might look like, or what a profile of a parent or community member might look like to help get that graduate to look like this profile? So they said they looked forward to working with me on that, so they didn't have any, any answers at that moment. But I think this is um, great information that you provided in your presentation in this PowerPoint that could help kind of guide them as well in reference to, you know, how do we meet the needs of a graduate looking like this? Well, this is absolutely how we meet the needs. And it is about having a teacher that is familiar with their community, with different cultures, and with their school. So I think this would lend itself perfectly to, to that program as well. And when it comes to sustaining the program and having those business partners who are investing in this, I think that, that the business community should absolutely invest. If they want to see our graduates look like this profile, then we need to invest in these teachers. So I, I believe there would be a lot of business community partners that we could um, tap into. And um, one more question, on the bachelor's degree, does it have to be in education or is it preferred? Anything. A bachelor's degree in anything. Okay. Well, thank you again for the presentation and um, we're excited. And board member Armijo, uh, superintendent and everybody on the board, I just want to mention that along with the conversation with Mission Graduate, one of the things that makes somebody want to become a teacher our teacher role models that they had going through school that were so engaged and excited about their own career that they modeled that for the future teachers. And those teachers, we all know, stick in our brains. We can name them. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing with the business community I would like your help with in any way possible is every time there's a career fair, there's all kinds of businesses that are invited to introduce 
a profession to a young person who might want to go into engineering or math, but they rarely have teaching as a profession that they highlight at career fairs. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make that another connection that we have with mission graduates. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you. Other comments? Uh, Board Member Patterson. Um, so you so you indicated that there are thank you for your presentation but thank you outstanding I'm mean, really excited about it you said you have 25 slots is that correct 25 25 student resident slots slots does that include okay so well does that include the EAs as well in that particular if they want to become a student resident if they already have their bachelor's, bachelor's degree, degree they can be a student resident okay and they would they would be included in the 25. Yes. In the 20, and so this program would actually cost about 500000 Correct. We are at our max. If we can get 25 residents, which I, I think we can, yeah. we have five already. You um, will. We will. It, it is exciting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Really Other supported. comments? I have one. Board Member uh, Montoya Cordova. So you had uh, mentioned some other uh, states or cities that are doing it. Have they? Ha, what kinds of things are they doing for uh, sustainability? I was just curious about how they're funding their pieces. We're going to have Lori speak to that one. Good evening, Board Member Montoya Cordova. Um, some uh, cities have turned to the business community. Some are have received federal grant funding. Some are sustained with Title I or Title II funding from a district budget. Others um, have set aside state funding. Uh, in particular, Louisiana has invested in a statewide residency program that's funded by the state. Thank you. Hmm. Um, yeah. Other board members? Board member Peterson? Yeah, thank you. It really is exciting and it's very much in line. I could have been listening to the presentation on No Time to Lose from the from the LESC because it's so much in line with what we know from research both within the United States and internationally of how to support incoming teachers. So it's really exciting. Um, will there be one thing, one question, is there a UNM faculty, faculty person at each of the three schools or sharing time among the three schools? Uh, with this, with this particular uh, program, we will have one, but that's where I mentioned the others, that we will have other faculty, also doctoral students. We'll have a team, basically, but we'll have the embedded faculty who is basically the major person who will help in uh, guiding and, and monitoring and things like that. We have other, other uh, programs with APS, I said before, and we do have an embedded faculty in each school. Those projects have been funded by Kellogg Foundation as well as the ECMC Foundation. And so right now, I, we have seven embedded faculty working with seven schools. This one will be a different one that we'll be working with is three schools. Okay, that, that, that's interesting because I was going to ask, I know, I know teachers who are involved with the co-teaching model at Bandelier, and so I was just curious about how this mirrors that, what's similar and what's, what's extraordinarily different? Um, yes, we were working with, we have been working with that co-teaching mm -hmm. model at Bandelier, and so many of the strategies that are used with co-teaching, we will be implementing uh, with this program as well. And they're doing this at the national level. You know, the training that's been coming forth from Chicago, they have a lot of the co-teaching um, strategies uh, in, in, embedded in that. It's, I mean, the thing that's so exciting is that it's not just what it does for the incoming teachers, but what it does for the, sc the school as a whole and for the master teachers, because we keep learning. And we need, we need opportunities to deepen that. So thank you. It's exciting. Uh, board member Pat Peterson, we failed to mention that they'll be in the classroom four days a week, and then one day of the week they will be subbing, substitute te teaching for the district as a, after we gradually release them. So probably October, November, there'll be a gradual release of their duties, and then they are... Um, you know, helping those schools and any other vacancies in the districts on the day they substitute. So it's a win-win. Thank you. Board Member Miller, are going? So when they make this application, is it made through UNM? 
how is it, is it made through UNM? We have our, uh, our website up, which I don't think we mentioned either. It's New Mexico Teach, a, a, no. <laughs> ABQ Teach. <laughs> that was a bad, <laughs> bad memory. <laughs> anyway, for all of you that know that. Um, and so they do apply, and they have to apply to UNM as well t to be part of the master's in the post back degree program. So it's a joint application and reviewed by both partners. And, and um, we're also going to interview them together. So they have to be interviewed to get into the program, and we'll be doing that as a partnership. So that'll be like APS, UNM, will be on the interview. All three the of us. Committee. Okay, and then um, when it, the courses that they're taking, are they gonna have to go to UNM for, the course, for their courses? Uh, we are looking at delivery on site. Okay, that's so, how yes. a lot of and residency so, uh, Most of the courses will be delivered on site. Some of them we do have online. So we're in the process now of really looking at the curriculum and, and really tailoring it. It's really uh, tailored uh, for the actual schools that we're working with. And then Dr. Flores, I know you said that they had three other courses, additional courses they have to take above the 24. Oh, yes. So do they have to pay, pay for the courses or is that 20,000 inclusive of those three additional? You know, they would have to pay extra, but, but we calculated what that 14,000 would cover and it would also probably cover those three courses. Yes. Okay, and so how long do they have to, to complete their master's? How many months do they have? Well, generally, um, generally it's 32 hours. Right. So uh, it varies. In this particular program, they'll be done within that year. And then if we, uh, they went on through the summer, they probably could take some of those courses, a couple of those, and then finish <coughs> up, I would say, with an additional semester. So. Okay. Uh, a year and a half. Yeah, about a year and a half in that sense, yes. Okay. And then I know that you talked about a full year of clinical experience. So that's based on the academic year at our APS schools, though. Okay. And then the last thing, I think, maybe two things. I know you said that, they, that residency trained teachers outperform other novice teachers. So what is that based on? Based on what's going on in some of these other states and how do they, how are you basing their, them outperforming other brand new teachers? Board member Muller Aragon. Um, that's based on some national studies um, of some of the longer running residency programs. In particular, Boston <coughs> has had a long running residency program, as has Chicago. And what they're doing is looking at um, student growth, student academic growth measured by test scores, comparing resident, first year residents versus first year teachers who were not residency trained. So I think in general, um, and I can let Dr. Flores speak to this as well, the research into the field of residency is, is quite new and it has a lot of other benefits as well as potentially the benefit of increased academic performance. Okay. We're hoping that's not, that's not everything because I think a teacher did a great job when at the end of the school year the kids still love learning and love coming to their class. So that's the measure of a great teacher. But that's just my opinion, so. Um, and then the, I think the last thing is, I know you, Dr. Bernstein, you had said you're looking for the master teachers. So are you close to having enough for the 25 residents? We just got the good hours. Yeah, I, I think we're just starting. Yeah. And one of the things that we're doing is advertising and making sure people know that the opportunity exists both to be a resident and to be a master teacher. So uh, we're at the beginning of that process. Oh yeah, we, I, well, I just wanted to, uh, I just want to say we've also visited the schools. We went to one of the staff meetings where the, with the principal, we met with the principal first and his staff, uh, then 
Then we met with all the teachers and talked about the program and encouraged them to uh, want to you know, be a mentor of these students. And so we just begun that. So we visited all the schools already. And so now we've opened it up for um, an application process. And so we're hoping that we will uh, re you know, get people to want to do that. It's tough. I know that they have a lot of other responsibilities. But like Dr. Bernstein mentioned earlier, it's what they also gain from helping us in the, in the preparation of the next generation of teachers. And I think that that's really an important role that they play. And then I, I guess my last comment on that is we might end up recruiting because one of the things that we have to do is figure out who is applying, what level of teaching and possibly subject they're interested in, and then making sure we have a match with a master teacher who has been accepted to be a master teacher. So it's going to be a little overlapping of inviting and recruiting and matching. And that's not, Dr. Bernstein, based on um, the effective exemplary. That's not what it's going to be based on, correct? The ratings. There's that no criteria given. for us to okay. base it on the ratings in the New Mexico evaluation. Okay. And then last thing is, I didn't see this anywhere. Is there some kind of a clawback provision? So let's say a resident starts and then they don't finish, and they do they have to pay back any of that any of that money? Do they have to teach for so many years? You know, I, I know when my daughter was in a residency, she had to come back to New Mexico, and then they would forgive a lot of her loan. So. Uh, Board Member Muller, Aragon, what we anticipate is that we will not be dispersing the full amount all at one time. So um, I believe we're looking at quarterly disbursements. And so if a student, if a resident were to not continue in the program, they wouldn't receive further money. So just up to wherever they were, where That's they right. were at when they left. That's right. Um, okay. We anticipate providing a lot of supports for residents so that they will be successful um, and that we hope we don't have to have anyone not complete the program. Yeah, and we want them to teach. I mean, we want them to teach, so we want here. them to be here. So and we don't so want them to we right. don't want them to leave. So that's why I asked that question because it's like we want to say if you complete this program and we paid for it, yes, you do have a job with APS, but we want to say you have to. Kind of. In speaking to Seattle, one of the other programs, the attrition rates overall are very minimal, maybe one, and it's because life happened in that case. So they're pretty low. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Board Member uh, Garcia. Thank you. I just had a general question uh, with regards to uh, an overview of the number of EAs who are potentially eligible. Do you, do you have an idea at this point? What's the university? We're running a report on every EA with a bachelor's degree already. We have the career pathway for them as in contract language. So many of them are in the process of working on their BA. So we're going to single those out and meet with them individually and let them know about this opportunity once they get their BA. But we also need to find out who those other EAs are who happen to have a BA and just aren't are just being an EA. So we're looking at that data to have a meeting and meet, you know, share the information. Um, I know we have other folks like at M&O and other food services and other places uh, where potentially someone with a BA uh, could be. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible that we could widen our sort of catchment area, if you will? Yes, we, we are marketing this. This is our first step in marketing the program, and so we're hoping the community hears about it from this. We're working with uh, the talk show in Santa Fe. Trina Walker, Walker from the program is going to be meeting with them. I'm meeting with Mike Brasher, the radio station. So we are going to be flooding the market with the information in our website and trying to get it out to everybody. I've, I've also shared it with the unions, all the unions. And I guess the other place, if we look a little further down the road, would be to look at uh, the early college and career high school, because we're going to have people who will be pretty close to getting their BAs. I mean, my idea is that uh, this is uh, this is important for us, but we need to really try to step it up and uh, let it have a life of, of its own, of course, but, but it will if we can get the word out. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Um, just a couple of quick questions for me. Um, 
Will current UNM students who are finishing their bachelor's degree be eligible to? I assume they will be. Yeah. And we're targeting some of them in the secondary program right now. Catherine Watkins, Professor Catherine Watkins, has five on the list that she's talking to. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think this is a great idea. Uh, the con concept of a clinical presence for teachers is a great idea. I mean, that's just, that's absolutely uh, wonderful. All of our related services people basically have clinic uh, uh, certification, and that's part of their normal process. So I think it's great. Uh, might even be nice to if this works out nicely and so forth, and we got a way to do it is to provide that even for bachelor's degrees last year to be able to have kind of a clinical experience so that they actually have, you know, as a bachelor's, they, they get this clinical experience. So they don't have to go on as a master's necessarily, but maybe it's a different kind of clinical experience for that. So I think that would be interesting. Um, some of my questions were answered to some extent. Um, How a master teacher was defined, yes. Uh, are they coming from the same three schools? Because that's 25 master teachers, and that's an awful lot of teachers that we would call master teachers from the three schools. So, President, Dr. Pierce, <clears throat> members of the board, during the site selection, we actually uh, considered how many student teachers they had placed at those schools and looked at the number of master, potential master teachers because we were concerned about that. But until we have the 25 residents selected, we won't know exactly what content area we're focusing on. Next. So it's going to be, um, we're going to have to yeah. sort of see where the so, chips so, lay on that. Yeah, and so do you know about, for example, you've got three schools. You've got elementary, mid school, and high school. So there will be different kind of, of master teachers in those. Uh, if I got an elementary school teacher, they might be a master teacher just because they're an elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, mid school might start to differentiate a little bit. High school definitely does. So you're gonna, uh, are you gonna have uh, is it kind of an equal number in elementary, mid school, and high school, or you just don't know yet? We just don't know yet. We're hoping. However, we thought about adding an elementary if we have more K-8 mm -hmm. or perhaps a secondary, mm -hmm. middle, high. So we're sort of waiting to see what we get. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting uh, possibility. And of course, what we call a master teacher, I mean, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, we, you're gonna get an argument probably from we some We wanted folks. to distinguish from our current mentor teachers because mm -hmm. most of the programs call them mentor teachers, uh -huh. but we wanna call them master teachers so we know they're not the regular mentor teacher in APS. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'll be an interesting question because uh, I mean, you know, you could say, well, they need to be national board certified, but that may not be exactly what you want either. Uh, it might be, might not be. Uh, you know, I mean, I think some of the things that board member Muller again said are important, and that may not be how you have the criteria. Also, uh, uh, in the subject matter area, uh, there are different people who are, are, are good and might be better as a mentor than just in their own subject matter. I mean, I can maybe can teach the subject matter very well, maybe wouldn't want to be a mentor, or maybe not be a very good mentor, even though I might want to try that. And that's a different kind of a role than just being a subject matter expert. Uh, and I, I talked about that a lot in terms of having subject matter experts come in and become a teacher. <sighs> you know, just because you're a subject matter expert doesn't make you a teacher. And, and so it's the same thing, even though I'm a teacher and I'm a subject matter expert doesn't make you a mentor. So uh, that'll be an interesting question is how you, how you differentiate that. So that's. And, and Dr. Piercy, on that note, I think when you look at somebody who is going to be stewarding the next generation of teachers into the classroom, you look at people who have experience, so it's not level one teachers necessarily. Hopefully you have a level three teacher. You might have to match with level two, which we have found in our mentoring program. Um, I think that you look at expertise as a teacher, but you also look at those kinds of attributes and attitudes about how a teacher works with somebody else. There are wonderful, amazing teachers who do it as a solo act best and not necessarily as somebody who's going to be letting go of their classroom, their students, 
and and imparting that knowledge on somebody else. So there's an aptitude to it also. Right. So it's almost like having a teacher's social emotional learning, social skills and so forth, which is a little different than just being a good teacher necessarily. Uh, and, and relationships that you build with, let's say, your students, so to speak, uh, which I'm sure Dean Ochoa understands that relative to their own teachers, you know, because that's kind of part of the deal when you're trying to teach people a subject matter. And we know that that's not always uh, a good skill that everybody has. Uh, so, very good. Well, I think it's a great program, absolutely great program. Uh, I compliment you all on it. I compliment the university for being partners with us and uh, the union as well. So, uh, I look forward to, to the results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Thanks. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll go on to item F, consideration for approval of the APS Open Meetings Act resolution, uh, Board of Education. Uh, that's a discussion action. We have to do that every year. I think in reality, as I looked at it, the only changes are really uh, typical changes, year changes and those kinds of things. Is that right? That is correct, Dr. Piercy. The only changes this year was the update of the year and then adding Secretary Montoya Cordova right. to the document. Right. And um, there was one change on the Exhibit A, the meeting schedule, and that was just being more specific about when audit committee meetings are this year. Right. And those are the only changes. Right. I'll make a motion. I think, okay, you've got a motion. Do I have a second? Okay. Are there any discussion? Uh, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go on to the uh, consideration for the APS Board of Education Participation in External Organizations. Uh, that's a little bit of a discussion action, primarily because we have a new board member here, I think. Uh, Again, Superintendent Reedy, Dr. Piercy, members of the board, um, this document should look very familiar to you with the exception of board member uh, Montoya Cordova. Um, this happened, you approved it October 23rd prior to her coming on to the board. So there are um, just a couple, actually one change and then I have a correction um, since that October 23rd date. The APS Education Foundation now now is inviting all board members to attend their meetings. So in addition to Dr. Piercy serving on the foundation board's um, board, all board members are invited to attend those meetings. So we will send those and get those dates on your calendar. And then the other change I just noticed um, late this afternoon under the School Health Advisory Council, there's a grammar error. It should uh, read the board members serving on the district council are. And so I, with your permission, I'd like to make that change as well in the last statement of that paragraph. Um, but with that, um, with those two changes, those are the only things that are changed, so I um, ask permission or, or your approval um, unless board member Montoya Cordova wants to arm wrestle you for um, one of those <laughs> slots um, on the organizations. <laughs> is there any arm wrestling involved here? Well, uh, the only thing I'm going to say is that, and it, I don't know how this is going to play out, but on the uh, community schools partnership, um, with my work, we have a vested interest in that because we're also uh, funding some of the work that they're doing. Um, and so I've been asked to, to go, but I have been holding back because I knew we had two other board members there right now. I would be going, I, I just wanna let you know, I would be going and showing up, but I'd be showing, I could potentially be showing up as part of the workforce uh, solutions department. Uh, but I was just worried because there would be three of us there. Does anybody see that as a problem? No. I think that's just fine with me. Okay. Okay. Uh, and also, just, just for board member uh, uh, Antonio Cordova, uh, we do this every year. We kind of look at this again every year, supposedly, and see if there's any changes we need or maybe another organization we need to participate with. And so uh, we do have, you know, some of those things. So we've talked in the past about other things that we serve on that aren't. And, and like there are many other things that people okay. serve on, you know, boards and various other things that really aren't on here. Um, and they represent you know, themselves, you know, right. basically on those kind of boards. But, but certainly because they're a board member here, they can have an interest in what APS might 
gain from that membership as well. You know, I mean, anything you do is, is valid for us to take credit for. So, you know, your workforce <laughs> solutions, all your workforce solutions now becomes an APS uh, uh, adventure. It's becoming that way. Yeah, so, sure. so we like that. Um, so any, anything else on this? Uh, if not, we'll, I think I don't, do we have an, uh, yeah, it is an action, okay. Um, for the changes that we had here, right? Okay, you, you've got a m board member Patterson has, has moved for approval and second? Second. Uh, second from board member Muller Aragon. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Point of information. Point of information. I'm sorry, I had to run out for a second. So, are we maintaining the same? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's just a matter of trying to update it a little bit for a couple of errors and then making sure that there are a couple things that were added to it. Yeah. Otherwise, we're, we're in the same place. Like I said, unless board member Montoya Cordova wants to have several other positions. And she didn't offer that, so. <laughs> Okay, all in, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll go on to uh, item 7B1, which is the hand, uh, update to the handbook. Uh, board member Muller Aragon wanted to pull that off. I think you have a couple of corrections at least on this maybe, and uh, I'm not sure what other things. So if you have something you'd like to say, uh, Peggy, please do. Um, just on the um, the ration of the reason for these, as I had mentioned at the policy meeting, the N New Mexico Administrative Code 6.108.8.2, there is no such there's no such code, and that's listed several times. Um, and I did call again today to make sure that there wasn't. So that really needs to be needs to be taken off because there isn't such a code. Um, and then the other thing there I looked, a couple places for that. there's like three or four, maybe more than that, that they need to be taken off. So um, I think in the glossary of terms, there were there were at least four pla four or five places. So we need to make sure and take that, that off because there is no such code. Um, and then the other thing in, um, I'm trying to think about how, because these don't have pages. I think it's on like number, Item number nine, where it starts in red on all absences. In there, we are supposed to have taken out, um, in the first bullet, we are supposed to have taken out in. And I know they tried, Dr. Piercy, to, to kind of rewrite it in a way that it was more easily understood. I still have a hard time kind of understanding it. When I was looking at in school that year, well, what does that mean? Does that mean a calendar year, an academic year? It's it's still, it's still, it, I'm still confused. And I, I tried to rewrite it in a way that I thought would be more understandable. And I looked at a couple of other um, districts that had written this, and what they had, a lot of them had written is, this is what they had written and enrolled students, so what they did is they put the word enrolled in front of students. So they said an enrolled student is chronically absent if they have, and everybody has a 10%, if they have missed 10% or more of the academic year for any reason, and then everything else that was there. And where, where give me a clue where this is, Peggy, I'm sorry. I, okay, I, on, okay, if you're looking at. Give me the number on the side. The number on the, number on the well, side. Well, there isn't. Um, it would be number nine, but it would be you'd have to flip to the other page because yeah. there's not a nine on there. And it's where it starts in red. So you see unexcused absences on the top of the page, and then it says all absences. It's just kind of hard because we don't have the numbers on every page. So is it, okay, all absences. I'm, I'm with you. You find that? So a, a student, student is, is chronic chronically absent. So, right. So that, what I just said is how I saw other districts try to get that information in there, but try to make it a little more clear. Um, I couldn't make it any more clear. That was the one that just made more sense to me. Do you want me to read it again, Dr. Piercy? Yeah, say what you think. Okay, this is what they had written. An enrolled student is chronically absent if they have missed 10% or more of the academic year for any reason, and then they had excused or unexcused, this amounts to approximately 
two or more days of school within a month. And then we need to take off that within in because we didn't take that part out. Remember, we kind of went over this a bit and, uh -huh. yeah, we did. and tried to find the right words. So is, that, and, is that the only change that you see? And then that would, I think that would have to get changed in the glossary of terms as well, right? Because I think that was in there, was in there again. But I don't know what everybody else thinks. I know we tried, we mulled over it and. May I add a comment? Yes, Board Member Garcia. Well, it seems logical that it would be school academic year. Rather, you know, I mean, we can be as clear yes, as we well, can on it. Academic year, I think just you know, makes it clear. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it flows, but, um, but if you want to be that precise, I think that's fine. I would be willing to say let's go with that. I think maybe the change other, is other board likely. members feel like okay with that? Yeah. Okay. I I feel, yeah, I like the wording. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. That works. I think that sounds sounds good. Uh, so be sure you get that wording to Brenda on that. Okay. And uh, and again, I think with regard to the uh, NMAC uh, one uh, six dot whatever one eighty. Uh, just just remove that. You can still say the uh, attendance act, you know, because there is an attendance mm -hmm. act. It's just that we maybe don't have the right number. If you got a number on it, you can put it in there. But I couldn't find it. I couldn't find a number. It's <laughs> you know, so I'm not sure exactly. But it's got to have a number someplace, I assume. But but I couldn't find it. So if, if you got a number, put a number there. If you can't find a number, take the number out because there is attendance act. So someplace it's there. So I think that's, so with those changes, is that, is that your discussion? Um, there? And then I, this is just because of everything that's kind of going on and I can't tell you where this is going to be. It's where everything starts in blue on number 11. So if we kind of go to, I can't even count them. I'm sorry. One, two. I think on the restorative, it probably start restorative justice practices. It's talking about the school safety team that a child could be referred to the school safety team that they may warrant if there are threats. That I just think that may should be that not should be may because threats if we look at some of the threats that happened in parkland they were threats and nothing happened so they weren't they didn't take them seriously and i think threats we're saying they're going to be taken seriously but then we use the word may because we've said that so it says situations that may warrant conducting a school safety team meeting include verbal and or physical threats to do harm. So then which of those would warrant, which of them may warrant and which of them may not? What kind of a, what kind of a threat to children's safety? And it's threats or use of use um, with weapons or explosives. So I'm kind of going, if somebody's threatening to shoot up a school, should it just be maybe we'll refer them to school safety team? I have a hard time with the word may. These are people threatening to. I think, I think the problem is, is that the term threat is a fuzzy, fuzzy term. And it could be. I said before, and the threat could be something as simple as saying, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I'm going to do something. And he says, oh, well, come on now. You know, and you don't have to go to safety. You just deal with it. But. There could be other threats that are very, very serious. Yeah, and, I mean, just because it does point, have that, yeah, and I threats. I think the point is, is that if weapon. you say threat, and then people say, well, that was a threat, and therefore you have to do this. I think the point is, is that they're trying to use the judgment of the, of the people there to say whether that's appropriate or not. Uh, you know, and we do that all the time, and we have judgment all the time in terms of these things. Uh, you know, in terms of restorative justice, it's, it's a judgment thing in terms of how you do that. So I mean, you, I don't know that you can be precise in terms of all the things that you might do. So that we get into this Deuteronomy of situations now, and then now there's every situation you're going to have to put it down is exactly what you're going to do with that situation. And if we can't rely on our people to to make a reasonably good judgment decision, I don't know what we can do there because it's such a fuzzy term. 
You know, I mean, what do we mean by threat? Even the idea of bullying, we can't even try to get that definition down very well. You know, because is, is it three times? Is it two times? Is it four times? Is it more than once? You know, it's, yeah, so you have to make that judgment, I think, a lot of times in these. So I don't know that uh, yeah. we have I mean, a way to do that very this well. This one is a little more specific because it does have threats of use or involvement with weapons or explosives. So it is a little bit more, where more concise. That? In that same bullet where it says situations that may warrant conducting an SST meeting include verbal and or physical threats, threats of use or involvement with weapons or explosives. I'm trying to. I know it's, I'm sorry, Dr. Piercy, it's kind of hard well, it's, to it's hard try to, to find, find, yeah. find it. I apologize. It's in the blue section, if you go, if you find the page that on one side has contracts, referrals. And it's in blue. And on the other side at the bottom it says removal from class. It's and right it's, above that. If you go to the second bullet above, above that. where it says removal for from there class. We go. There we go. <laughs> I should have numbered them all. Well, Dr. Pearson, may I weigh in? You sure, yeah. So, so here's my concern. We have folks who basically make these assessments on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, last year, I don't know how many threats we got from all kinds of places, and they are jumped on, investigated, uh, the principals are brought in. It's a team effort so that I don't think that... Taking away may will make a difference. I don't know that it'll make a difference. I think where it ties our hands that you end up uh, sending a, a, a number of young people through the criminal justice system when uh, in some cases that's appropriate. But I think in some cases it's one of those what I describe as a knucklehead phase or a silly uh, adolescent, you know, lack of judgment kind of act. And I think we have folks who are in place to review what was done. Uh, it all goes all the way to the superintendent. I think the redundancy is making sure that we look and somebody looks over one's shoulder, if you will, to say, you know, I think you missed something here. But my sense of it is that what we're trying to do is dictate safety. And I don't, I don't know through my experience that you can necessarily predict every case. Oh, you can. Some are outlandish. Uh, I, obviously, to try to compare in hindsight what happened in Florida, um, you know, gosh. Well, and I, I think, again, that, that whole sentence is more than just weapons. And that was my point. Right. Is that situations that may warrant conducting that include verbal and our physical threats to do harm threats to use involvement with weapons and explosives. And there's, there's a wide range here that they're telling you about. Not, right. It's not just weapons. Right. And so, uh, you know, they're trying to give you some examples, which is always dangerous. <laughs> and all I want to do is make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure our right. kids are safe right. and we're using the words that we need to use. Sometimes that's all we, that's all we have. So we need to try to use them well, the, best that we, the best that we can. Yeah, you know, sometimes we don't have the money to put into action a plan, a real plan, so we have to use what we can. And I agree with, with Lorenzo, too, that there are some kids that would get, you know, put, go to the safety team that didn't need to. But then there might well, be somebody and, you know, who... we, we may err in terms of... Uh a little more conservative, you know, there was, uh, go ahead and have them talk to the safety team, where you, you know, depending upon the situation. Uh, right. Because that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to send you to jail. It just means we need to talk, talk about what the issue is here. Right. You know, we had the seven-year-old that said this weird thing to the kids. Well, come on, let's go talk about this, you know. I mean, you're seven years old, you know. Uh, and so I think that's, and I think the situation may be different if I happen to be a, a junior in high school or a, a senior in high school. I mean, that's a little different situation in terms of a cognitive ability here to, to do things. Uh, so I think that's the, you know, the team has to decide those things. And I think we take all threats seriously is the point. We take all threats seriously. How we deal with them has to be part of the judgment situation. So, you know, I think that's the point is that we take all, ser all threats seriously. Uh, so we're not going to throw a threat out just because we think, well, you're just being a knucklehead. We're going to look at that and see whether you are a knucklehead or not. And we're going to find out whether that's the situation or whether it's not the situation, you know. And uh, if someone says they have a gun in their backpack, we're going to find out. 
We're not going to say, oh, well, you don't have a backpack even, you know, you don't have a gun. Well, what are you, the point is, what are you talking about? Why are you talking this way? What situations here are leading you to that kind of, of, a, of a statement here, you know? We need to find out. And there are root causes here that we maybe need to address. And those are some of the things that we haven't done in schools. And that's what they didn't do in Florida. They didn't do that, you know, because they didn't figure out what was going on. Uh, so I, I, I think, again, the sentence to me makes okay, as long as we understand that we're going to take all threats seriously and we're expecting our people to be trained to some extent or to at least work with people who are trained to figure out what these are. Uh, our counselors, maybe our, 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 our police department folks, uh, you know, various other people who are dealing with these issues all the time. Uh, I can't expect every teacher to know everything here, so they've got to get the team together to figure out you know, what these issues are. Uh, so I, I don't think, I think it's okay the way it is. But again, I think they're just trying to give you some examples here, and they're certainly not covering all examples. They're just saying here's some situations, and there's, they're giving you a range of situations basically here, of which some of which will obviously say you need to go to the SST. You know, if you're talking about weapons, you're probably going to go to the SST. Sure. You know what I mean? Period. Because we need to figure out what's going on. Uh, well, I guess we could say that, but then now we get into the Deuteronomy, well, how about other situations? What are you going to do in that situation? Are you going to go there or not go there? I think that we've got to allow, allow our, our team to, to make that decision. Okay. So. so do we want to say that they will be taken seriously? They may, they may result in this behavior <laughs> or this action? Jeez, <laughs> oh, I just lost the pace. So, you know, I... Um, I but, Scott, you have a you have an input. <laughs> you want to keep the me in for a lot of reasons. Yep. The number one reason is to remember this handbook is for K twelve, so the may gives you that latitude just mm -hmm. just on the age basis. Yes, you need the may. Yeah. So I I absolutely think if you've got a, what you're thinking about, board member Mueller Aragon, a kid walks in with a gun. Oh, absolutely. That's not a may. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, but, but we can't delineate every single case because students are very creative in the way they break the rules. And having dealt with the twice exceptional students at CEC, they did amazing things. It challenged me uh, as a disciplinarian <laughs> to really have to be very, very creative to keep up with them. Um, so uh, not having it locked down into a, a, yeah. an absolute was very helpful. Uh, with those kids. I, I think we have to have the language that says we take every set threat seriously because we do. And I think it needs to be in writing, it needs to be our philosophy, it needs to be our action. So I have, I have absolutely no problem with that. I, I mean, then we can add what Barbara said. So do we want to do that just to add in the statement? Every threat will be taken seriously. Threats will be taken seriously. They may result in this. Because we, we're now dealing with threats, and, and, and as you mentioned in the last few weeks, we're dealing with threats that are not just somebody walking up to you and saying, hey, I'm going to do X. We're getting threats across the internet, through social media, mm -hmm. that is actually requiring tremendous uh, resources, both using state and federal resources to track back, which are resulting in arrests for young people in New Mexico. Don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But okay. we need to make it very clear, we're not going to allow anything. And some of the students, will, I mean, we had one, young young student tell us i did it because i wanted the day off a horrible lesson to learn uh but yeah, he scared 1500 people um you know we've had others that were doing it because they thought it was a social experiment they just wanted to see what, what would happens. happen exactly their kids but they, yes. you have to put it we will not tolerate this and we will investigate with full resources and we may really bring the hammer well, let me, let me just on that basis there, then right after it says the first sentence, the first sentence that says students may be referred to the student safety team, da da da, da the period. And at, at that point, we'll just say every threat will be taken seriously. Because you've met, you said how to manage threats and ensure safety. And so it's to say every threat will be taken seriously. That means exactly what you're going to do. And then we say each school safety team may include members of sub and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we could add that 
just to make sure everybody understands that exactly what you said. Now, we could make more words in there. Or you not. But I, I think, again, if we say we're taking every threat seriously, that means we are going to investigate, we are going to process, we are going to do that. Uh, the result of that may well be different things, depending upon what and you find. Just the other correction that was brought up, uh, the compulsory attendance law yeah. uh, is listed as, what, 6.108 point something? Yeah. Is 6.10.8. Okay, so it's let me let me also out of 108. They just need a dot between the zero and the eight. Ten so I've been doing the research too over the last few minutes, and it was in two places. The state listed it as six point eight point ten. Well, whatever it is. And then, there, but then there was one place what you just said listed it as six point ten point eight point one. Six point ten point eight point one initially, and the point two establishes the authority of the school board. Right, but there were two places where the, the state and their um, education committee listed it as 6.8.10. Yes, I think in the final bill is what it matters. So, so the final bill is what you said, 6.10.8.1. So if you want the actual language, we can do that, or we can just... Just, just put the number down. The collect, you know, the just put the <laughs> number down. Just put the number down. 6.10.8.1. Whatever it is. Point ten. Point eight, point or you one. cannot do that and just put the school compulsory, compulsory and that make it that. easy and then you don't I don't have to worry about dots then you don't have to worry about dots so whichever I one you to want to do yeah. let's just delete the number then yeah so this is right. supposed to go that whole gamut and yeah. Um, some people are very, very literal, and I, we need that kind of flexibility yep. in order to work with whatever age group we're working with. So, mm -hmm. so with those changes. I'd like to make a motion. Second. Right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. No. Um, no, no. I still had, oh, there were so many things still, oh. Dr. Pearson. Well, you got to have some, got to have a handbook. So we're going to have a handbook. We can keep working on the changes and improvements. So I, I abstained I, at, at the committee, and I gave my reason for the abstention is that I just think that it, we needed some more time to do this. Look how much time it took during this, during this uh, board meeting. I, I just think we need to do this in advance, well in advance, and with more participation. And being able to read this on the internet, it's not it has not been translated into Spanish. So this was on the website and parents could, uh, those who don't have access to this kind of information probably could not um, provide input. So for that reason, I abstain and I, I apologize. I know I appreciate all the work you did on this and stuff, but I think we need to reach out to our community whom we make changes to this handbook. It's supposed to be the handbook that actually helps our students in the school and our parents as well to bring our schools, to bring our students forward in academia. Thank you. Okay, I do think we work on the handbook almost year round. Is that correct? Yes. So it's not like we just all of a sudden in the last week decided to make some changes to the handbook. So if you can take your suggestions in terms of making sure that we have things on you know, Spanish as well as, as English, making sure that people know early enough making sure we get that and maybe bring it to the board a little earlier because we tend to be picky and I think that's okay. So, you know, uh, that might, might help the process a little bit to get a little bit earlier in terms of getting it to us. So that'll help. Okay. With that, we'll go on to the general approval of the consent calendar items, less this 7B.1, which we just approved. Uh, so I'll have a motion for the acceptance of the calendar items uh, without that one item. So moved. And a second. Can, I, can we request some information regarding, before we vote on it? Could I have can a I, second before we have second. a discussion? Okay. Thank you. Probably. Okay, now Sorry. we have a discussion. Okay. Um, regarding the funding for the PE, I looked through and I can't figure out I can't figure out where that information is coming There's from. There's nothing in this uh, thing about that. Is, uh, yeah. but is there conspiracy members of the board, there is no consent item uh, uh -huh. on this. There never has been. No. Nope. Uh, so the earlier call to remove it from consent, I believe the gentleman was mm -hmm. you know given information that was yeah. that felt I, there is no consent yeah. item here. 
Yeah, I know Michael real well, and I told him, I said, as far as I know, we have no information as a board about any of this, which means I, there would be nothing on the consent item about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know, I don't even know that there's any options out there being that, but I says, you guys are working on options. And I says, if it, if it comes to us, then we'll discuss that. But as far as I know, I don't know anything about uh, the idea of cutting the PE or having a grant not renewed, or I, I know nothing about that. Yeah, you, you, you wouldn't. Uh, there is no grant. Uh, there was no grant. Right. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, yeah, there's nothing on here, Barbara, as far as I know that has anything to do with that. Yeah, I, I couldn't find it, but could we get, could we sort of investigate a little bit where we, we where that information we, we know was coming from? What, what, what's, what, the, what it is. Um, well, this is not part of this item yeah, here. It's, yeah. not, it's okay. not on the agenda. Okay. I want to make so sure you understand yes. that yeah. we're talking about this, right. these consent items. Soon. Yeah. Actually, so I think the if we could have some time to, to do a report. report. Yeah. Yeah. That way you can oh, Okay. That, that would be helpful because I think everyone on the board wants full funding for PE. And we're not going to turn down money so, that would fund no, PE. there is no grant. And it's there not no grant. in this, so. The point is there's no grant here about that. Nor are we returning any. Right. Well, I knew that wasn't the case because I knew we wouldn't have okay. done that. <laughs> so, are we done with the discussion? Okay. All in favor of the consent items, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Uh, we do have board member comments. Uh, any? <laughs> do you doubt? <laughs> <laughs> choice you're getting as grumpy as Don was about board member about timing and board member comments <laughs> try to pick something new that we haven't heard before we say that to our public forum people I will I mean it's on the agenda board member comments <laughs> But I'm just going to open it up. I'm going to open it up. I'm not going to go down the line because then you feel like you have to make a comment. If you don't want to make a comment, don't don't raise your hand. If you want to make a comment, raise your hand. Okay. We do have over 600 people over at College 101. We do. Thrilled to death. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you know, we we can do it here and hope that it's we're useful or or not. But. I, if I'm we all can up. just say we won't make a comment, then <laughs> that would be fair. That would Everyone. be fair. That would be fair, but I, I then need Then if to. I make a comment, then Barbara will, she'll make a comment for sure. I'll wait until next time. <laughs> and, and I will I have lots do that, to we can say try to get time. to Highland. Well, we do, we do have a lot of things that are going to be on our plate. We do have some things that we're going to have to really consider very seriously here. And I don't want to be commenting on some of those things, as I mentioned in my email to you all. But if there's something you really got to say here, please do say it. I don't want to limit that. But again, I'm just going to open it up. I'm not going to go down the line. So if, if, if nobody wants to say anything, that's great. This is dedicated to the one I love. <laughs> oh, no. Dinner ready I, yet? <laughs> well, I've got a whole president's report I want to give now. <laughs> okay. Okay, I appreciate, I appreciate you guys a lot. Um, I do want to allow, if we can, if people can get over to, to Albuquerque High, I think that's an interesting thing. I was really incredibly amazed by the number of people that were there. So, and we do still have a closed meeting that we have to go to, so. Dr. Piercy, if, if I may make a comment. Sure. If I, you know, one of the, just real quick, 20 seconds. Uh, you know, Scott was one of the people responsible for getting those folks out at Hayes Middle School. He spent an enormous amount of time, and I think he only had like two hours of sleep, I remember, uh, Superintendent Reedy sharing that with us, and I don't think he got thanked. He doesn't get enough thanks for that, and I think we just need to give you a round of applause. That's it. He got a certificate. He got a participation certificate. Well, yes. Yeah, but he, nobody said anything. No, thank you. All right, thank you. I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip my report. And an announcement of upcoming board meetings is next board meeting will be held Wednesday, April 4th, here, and the next special board meeting will be held Monday, April 23rd, in the Delano Martin. And then we have consideration for approval of the APS Board of Education convene. 
an executive session uh, pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, NMSA 1978-1015-187 for the purpose of discussing matters pertaining to pending litigation, attorney-client privilege related to Guadalupe Montes and Sergio Loya Sr. as parents and next friends of Sergio Loya Jr. versus Lorenzo Martinez and Albuquerque Public Schools, D202CV216-3867. Uh, do I have a motion for approval? So moved. And, and uh, roll call, please. Yes. Peggy Mueller Aragon? Yes. Lorenzo no, Garcia? Yes. Barbara Peterson? Yes. Candelaria Patterson? Here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's, called, it's called we I'm here or C guess. or whatever. Elizabeth Armijo? Yes. <laughs> Dr. David Piercy? Yes. With that, we will adjourn to the Dale Martin room uh, for our hopefully quick yeah, meeting. Quick next meeting.